Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. In 2016, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, made the first accepted detection of gravitational waves. So anytime you move a mass, it produces a gravitational wave. So black holes, like the ones LIGO detected, these are stellar mass black holes, about 10 times the mass of the sun. When they're in orbit, they're accelerating constantly, so constantly producing gravitational waves. Sarah Burke Spallor of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in New Mexico at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Boston on February 18th. For gravitational waves produced by the acceleration of even bigger masses, we're going to need what's called the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA. Now, if you think of much bigger masses, something like, you know, a million times the mass of the sun, these things are moving much more slowly, much more far apart, and they're producing lower frequency gravitational waves. And this is what LISA can detect. So LIGO, which is operating at these very fast orbits, fast frequencies, um, is unable to detect these things that are moving much more slowly and are on a much bigger scale. And for even bigger masses, you get to what Burke Spallor is working on, pulsar timing arrays. What we do with this technique is use radio telescopes to observe pulsars, which are neutron stars that are rotating very rapidly um, and sending their beams of emission across Earth about um, several hundred times per second. Um, and the idea is, of course, that a if a gravitational wave is passing through Earth, the gravitational wave is stretching and squeezing our space-time, and the tick that we see from these very, very regularly spinning pulsars is speeding up and slowing down. Just like we can scale the, the stellar mass black holes that LIGO can detect to very, very intermediate mass, very large black holes that LISA can detect, pulsar timing arrays will probe the very massive end of this distribution and the most massive, so the billion um, to even 10 billion solar mass binary black holes in the universe. So every time you get a galaxy merger, you can get a binary supermassive black hole, which then will contribute signal to our pulsar timing arrays by propagating through the galaxy. Of course, gravitational waves does not stop at detection. What we really want to do is astrophysics with gravitational waves and use it as a new tool to observe the universe and understand our place in it. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. We have increasing doubts about this evidence, but we don't feel yet that we have the scientific knowledge and basis to exclude it altogether. Jed Rakoff, United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York, he spoke about forensic evidence and the need for it to actually be based in science at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Boston on February 18th. In 2009, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report critical of a lot of the forensic evidence in the courtroom. Most fundamentally, the report said that what was really lacking was testing and research. And thus, they questioned whether any of this could be called science, and they also questioned whether it was really that accurate. But forensic evidence is still widely admitted, even when the science behind it may be lacking. I think courts continue, despite their doubts, to admit this evidence. And that is still the feeling that eh, it's still better than nothing. It's still useful evidence. It, it has some degree of objectivity that's not present in much lay testimony. And therefore, it is useful. Uh, the problem, of course, is it comes uh, heralded as science, and that gives it a weight that is probably disproportionate. Um, I had a case, this was uh, before the National Academy report, but it's sort of illustrative of what I'm talking about, United States versus Glynn. Um, in that case, the uh, government put on a uh, tool mark expert to testify that the markings on the shell that had been found at the scene of the crime matched the markings inside the barrel of the gun that had been found under the defendant's bed. And I asked him, for example, uh, what's your error rate? Uh, and what's the error rate of this methodology that you're using? And he said, zero. And I said, zero? Uh, and he said, yes. And I said, how can it be zero? And he said, well, in every case I've testified, the guy's been convicted. Uh, <laughs> 
For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. The paleo diet, it's pretty trendy. Eat like a caveman, no dairy, no grains, no sugar, and so on. But what you probably won't find on many paleo plates today... Pine nuts and moss and tree bark and mushrooms. Laura Weirich, a paleo microbiologist at the University of Adelaide in Australia. What we would like to call the true paleo diet. (laughs) It's basically what you could find in a forest um, if you're not eating meat. Weirich and her colleagues cleaned the teeth of Neanderthals found in Belgium and Spain. They popped off bits of ancient dental plaque and then sequenced the DNA contained within to see if it matched up to any known sequences today. What they found suggests that the northern Neanderthals ate a meat-heavy diet, stuff like woolly rhino and wild sheep, whereas their southern counterparts, they ate that forest-foraged vegetarian fare, mushrooms, pine nuts, and moss. One of the Spanish specimens also appeared to have taken a tree-derived painkiller related to aspirin and might have self-medicated with antibiotic penicillium bacteria, too. And the Neanderthal's mouth microbiome, on average, resembled that of chimps more than modern humans. And they have a much healthier set of bacteria in their mouth as well. They don't have the, the nasty bacteria um, in the right proportions to really chew holes in their teeth and cause periodontal disease. They really were very healthy. And their teeth, she says, are still sparkly white today. The studies in the journal Nature. Perhaps the most intriguing finding, though might be that humans and Neanderthals appeared to swap mouth microbes at one point in time, something that Weirich says probably happened not through violent interactions, but when kissing or sharing food. I think this paper in general just really suggests that Neanderthals were, again, not like this, um, you know, caveman, brute, grunting type animal that they often get described as. You know, they had knowledge about medicines, they had knowledge about their environments and what they could eat. Um, and they were, you know, having friendly interactions with other species. So it's it's a very different picture of Neanderthals. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. And this mission would be NASA's first mission that is directly tasked with searching for signs of life on another world, since the Viking spacecraft were given that task back in the 1970s on the surface of Mars. Kevin Hand of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We talk about finding or searching for signs of life on some of these ocean worlds, and in particular, these geologically active ocean worlds with rocky seafloors like Europa. Hand spoke February 17th at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Boston. He's the deputy project scientist for the Europa mission, which plans to send a land to the ice-covered moon of Jupiter. We're talking about environments where life could be alive today. So the w- these ice shells may serve as a window into the oceans below, and oceanic material may be coming up to the surface where a mission like a lander could actually sample that material directly. And I'm the pre-project scientist for this mission. Uh, this is a mission that would uh, uh, reach the launch pad in the 2024 to 2025 time frame. Uh, It would land on Europa's surface and operate for about 20-plus days. The instrumentation that gets sent to Europa needs to be able to recognize signs of life in minute amounts. A picomole of organics per gram of sample is one key requirement. Being able to detect cell number abundances to as low of a level as 100 cells per milliliter of, of, of ice acquired from Europa's surface. We reached that benchmark by comparison to subglacial Lake Vostok here on Earth. And the size that uh, the the microscope and the model payload would need to be able to um, uh, characterize is down to a 0.2 micron diameter uh, for any putative uh, organisms collected in a surface sample of of Europa. This mission is is a bold, uh, very exciting mission that marks NASA's return to the, the direct search for life via in situ capabilities on a potentially habited ocean world beyond Earth. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. The Earth is studded with telescopes, listening for electromagnetic radiation from the great beyond. And a decade ago, astronomers stumbled upon a mysterious signal, a powerful pulse of radio waves just a few thousandths of a second long. Mysterious because... What is the nature of the sources? Avi Loeb, a theoretical astrophysicist at Harvard. 
Whatever the sources are, he says. They seem to be brighter by tens of billions of times more than the brightest radio sources we know about. The radio pulses are known as fast radio bursts, and Loeb says you'd need something tens of billions of times brighter than a pulsar to produce them. So he and his colleague, Manas Lingam investigated another possibility. We know of one simple way to generate very powerful radio waves, and that's using radio antenna. A radio antenna built and controlled by extraterrestrials, to be more precise. Loeb and Lingham did the math on how big that stellar-powered radio antenna would have to be to transmit signals like fast radio bursts, and whether it would even hold up from an engineering standpoint, like would it melt under its own heat. Using those energy and engineering constraints, they found that the radio beam emitter would have to be twice the diameter of Earth. Pretty big for us, but at least theoretically possible, he says, for more advanced civilizations. The study is in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. To be clear, this is definitely not proof that intelligent aliens exist. It's just proof of concept that someone smarter than us could, in theory, build such a thing. And why you might build it? The idea is that an advanced technological civilization could produce a beam of radio waves focused on a sail uh, that is pushing on the sail such that eventually the sail will reach a fraction of the speed of light. We'll just have to see what arrives first. Alien sailors pushed by radio waves or the technological advances to allow us humans to build such a thing ourselves. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata.